expensive topic, uh, which will be network threat defense. Uh, Randy and Joe uh, are teaching a class at Black Hat. Uh, actually, focus on a lot of the hands-on stuff behind that talk, uh, and they will be uh, creating a small lab downstairs. So if you would like to follow up on the talk and just work with them uh, through some of the exercises, uh, just you know, congregate in this area and then everybody will go downstairs and you SSH into the routers and play with them. Um, and the, this is it, Randy. Thanks, Krasi. I just want to thank Bay Threat for giving us the opportunity to present in a bar with beer at 10 in the morning. This is awesome. <laughs> So we figure uh, our presentation can't be that bad because you all have beer. Well, who has beer right now? Well, coffee, beer. So uh, yeah, we're ambidextrous that way. So anyway, uh, we're in the uh, breaking security track. So what we're going to do is just give you a quick overview of what we're showing network operators so that they can furiously clean up after you as you're breaking stuff or hopefully to be proactive and make it so that you have a much harder time breaking stuff. So quick agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about how things are out in the world, some of the threats we see against IP networks and some other stuff. So how many of you run networks, know people who run networks, a few of you? And uh, by the way, Chrissy gave us extra drink tickets. If you ask questions, we'll hook you up. So uh, where we're at for network security, um, well, first off, it's a jungle out there, as I'm sure many of you are aware of. Uh, one thing we've noticed quite frequently, and our customers run into this, hopefully before the problem, but sometimes during or after, is that having a firewall and an antivirus does not equal network security. Um, despite what uh, marketing and sales may tell us, it's not really something you can buy in a box that's shrink-wrapped. Uh, technology definitely helps, but your policy operations and how you design your networks is absolutely critical. So one thing we like to point out to our network operators is that you should strive for operational simplicity. How you operate your network, how you manage it is critical you know, above and beyond just having the system, again, the shrink wrap in place, it's what you do with it once it's there. If you have that great IPS out at the edge of your network and uh, you don't take the time to baseline and tune what's coming through it, pretty soon you'll start ignoring all those events and all that good stuff that you would have seen and could have correlated with your firewall, with your routers and everything else, yeah, you're not even seeing it anymore. So uh, moving on to some of the different types of threats we see out there. Uh, this is just to help operators understand, you know, you know, one, they know it's a jungle, but you know, what the different animals and you know, dangerous plants are in that uh, jungle. Uh, are any of you familiar with CVSS, Common Vulnerability Scoring System? Excellent. So uh, that's sort of how the vendors can communicate how bad a problem is to our users. So if we have um, like a security vulnerability in a Cisco product, yeah, we'll give uh, the operators a CVSS score so they can say, yeah, this one's really horrible, we'll fix it first, or this one just sort of middle of the road and you know, we'll get to it in a change window coming up. So uh, one thing that we like to point out is that it, it doesn't need to be an attack that can mess your network up. You know, natural disasters, you know, we've had some good ones recently, um, what, Superstorm Sandy, uh, any number of earthquakes, you know, here recently, uh, you know, when the world ends here in two weeks, so what, December 21st? Yeah, that'll be a network down event as well. So, yeah, what, the distinction is that when it's uh, uh, human involved, there's intent somehow. Otherwise, it's just your, your network's screwed. So, some of the uh, different types of attacks that we run into, yeah, that top one is huge right now. Resource exhaustion, denial of service. Yeah, how many of you uh, uh, paid attention to the financial services attacks that hit a bunch of the big banks here recently? So that was just one um, example of denial of service. It's really back in vogue now with all the hacktivism out there and you know, people making a statement. Uh, you know, it used to be that the miscreants, 
Yeah, that's a trademark term, I think. But anyway, the miscreants wanted the uh, network up because that's how they made money. Uh, but now there's a lot of them that you know, just want the network up for them, not necessarily for you. So it, it's definitely a shift from what we had seen in years past. You know, denial of service is definitely um, at the top of everyone's list right now. And these aren't just you know, you know, garden variety denial of service attacks. These are 100 gigabits per second uh, bursting, you know, sustained attacks out to 70 gigabits per second. These are just huge data rates. I mean, having a firewall, yeah, that's great, but they, yeah, they roll over when you're talking about that much junk hitting your network. Let's see, spoofing attacks, and we tend to be interested in those, especially uh, when it comes to connection list protocols and services. So spoofing and transport protocol tend to work together. Uh, yesterday, uh, the presentation about H3C, you know, that was SNMP. So I can take advantage of uh, the connectionless properties of UDP for SNMP. And if you had a read-write SNMP community string, you know, even though you can't route packets back to me attacking you, I can still you know, take advantage of trust and you know, rewrite your configurations, you know, add my users, add routes for myself through SNMP. So all sorts of good stuff. Uh, routing protocol tax. Yeah, every once in a while, the BGP routing table gets screwed up. A few years ago, what, Pakistan thought they were YouTube, or the best route to it anyway. So, uh, you know, intent wasn't really there, but, it, you know, it all looks the same to us. Let's see, attacks against IP control plane services. So all sorts of attacks against DNS right now. We see a lot of that. Uh, yeah, the rest of them, software vulnerabilities, yeah. Lump that with application layer attacks. There's all sorts of good stuff going on at the application layer. And you know, we don't see as much malicious network reconnaissance anymore. So many of the attacks are targeted and there's so much information to be lifted out of Facebook uh, or, and other social media uh, sources that we just don't see the automated scanning except for like proxies that we used to. And um, for those of you that are IPv6 enabled or moving to IPv6, yeah, it's all the same stuff. Yeah, you know, the attacks that work against v4, the, a lot of them work against v6 as well. So that's just some examples. And collateral damage. So you know, when we're talking about attacks that are 100 gigabits per second, it's not just the victim that gets screwed. It's you know, everyone else in that same point of presence, other people at that same provider, you know, there's just so much traffic that it starts to, you know, it's like your sink backing up, you know, your drains backing up, it all floats to the top and there's uh, you know, a lot more than just the victim that gets impacted and around collateral damage, the next couple slides talk about uh, what we saw here with the financial services attacks. So, yeah, we worked with a lot of the uh, institutions that got hit by the financial services denial service attacks. Again, DOS attacks are huge right now. Uh, security teams thought they were prepared, but they just hadn't prepared for that much traffic and uh, understood how it was going to impact their networks and their providers. And there were many victims at the same time. So you, know, you work with your service provider. You, know, you were the only victim. They could definitely help you out, but when they had to you know, work three or four or five different uh, attacks at the same time, yeah, they were resource constrained as well. Uh, traditional uh, infrastructure, yeah, uh, IPS and firewall, they're great until you start seeing these big denial of service attacks, and you know, we saw a lot of them just fold under the stress. Um, content switches, load balancers, none of them were happy with that much traffic. And the scrubbing services, so, you know, the you know, AT&T, Verizon, you know, they'll scrub your traffic for you. They can filter out a lot of this junk, the denial of service. But again, they were so oversubscribed with these attacks that, you know, they'd have to shift from one attack to the next to the next. And you know, people have, who had bought their service were still getting uh, impacted because there just wasn't enough scrubbing to go around. So uh, the uh, victims that were best protected were the ones that had an on-site uh, service as well as just the cloud scrubbing. And take it for what it's worth, but uh, the law enforcement agencies definitely had some intel around what was going on and they were able to help coordinate. Uh, whether or not you'll actually reach out to them, yeah, entirely up to you. Uh, this says, B4 
beforehand, make sure you have clear lines of communications with the people that can help you. Uh, we'll plug vendors. You know, we, could, we were absolutely able to help customers. Service providers, they can help as well. Uh, even when they're oversubscribed, you know, the people that have the best relationships are the ones that are going to get the most help and the most help fastest. Uh, also, the ISACs, you know, there's, what, 15 or 16 uh, information sharing analysis centers for different critical infrastructure. So the financial services ISAC definitely was helpful in this case. And moving down the list, baseline your networks, please. Uh, you got to know what's legit. You got to know what's normal so that you can quickly identify these attacks and react to them. Uh, you don't want to be several hours into this event. Your customers you know, aren't able to get to your sites. You're losing money and you didn't realize it. And at the end, please take a look at what worked and what didn't work. Um, the way you do business today yeah, may not be the best way to respond to these attacks. So you know, definitely learn from them. You know, don't just, you know, whew, glad we're done with this one and move on because odds are good you'll see another one soon. So around that, incident response, you know, this, this is what we recommend to network operators. You know, six phases, preparation by far the, uh, the most intensive, the one that usually gets blown off, but it, it's the one that pays the most benefit. You know, get ready for it, get your tools, you know, train your teams, have some procedures, you move to identification. Uh, you know, how do you know there's an attack going on? What tools do you have to help you learn about the attack? And then how do you classify the attack? You know, what is it? Is it, you know, is that the network layer? Is it a transport layer attack? Is it, you know, application layer? And then trace it back to your edge up into the provider cloud, get their help because, you know, especially around these huge data attacks, you're gonna need your service provider to help you mitigate it. You just don't have enough bandwidth to mitigate the attack yourself. You're gonna need help. You're gonna need to do it before it aggregates in your pipe. And then reaction, what tools do you have in place to uh, help you mitigate the attack in addition to what the provider is doing for you? In some cases, it may be what do you need to you know, jumper out, you know, your load balancers, your content switches, so they don't contribute to the problem. And then again, post-mortem, you know, what worked, what didn't, and you know, absolutely learn from it. Uh, how, why this is helpful is that you can convey to management what a great job you did and how much uh, revenue you saved the company, how many effort hours things cost, and maybe you'll get more resources or budget for the next one. So we also talk about designing a secure network. Flip it again. So we look at it from a couple different perspectives. First off is, um, you know, how you interact with the rest of the, uh, the internet, you know, make sure you've got your routing in place, your uh, DNS. Then you know, look at how you deploy your services so that they're resilient, uh, so that you've got uh, redundancy so you can handle these big attacks. And then how do you harden the individual devices to buy you time to react to the attack? You know, buy yourself a few minutes, the device can stay up and working even under heavy loads let you identify the problem, and then react to it without legitimate users being kicked off. So one good way to um, build your network is, you hit again. Yeah. is how you use IP addressing. You know, we have a lot of customers that their network sort of evolved, or you know, they're an amalgamation of many different networks as you know, they merge with other companies. It makes it real hard to protect your networks using traditional security devices or features like access lists or firewalls. So especially as we move to IPv6, you know, we've got an opportunity to potentially readdress our networks and build a scheme that will allow us to deploy security features uh, a little easier and maintain them a little easier. So we would suggest that uh, you have dedicated you know, network address ranges for these different types of things, like your loop uh, back addresses in your routers, you know, connectivity to different services, like in this case talks about how you provide service to your partners, uh, remote access, voice, having those all nice and segregated makes it really easy to deploy access lists. And you know, we can um, use the features to sort of work around some of this, but it gets to be um, it gets to be interesting, especially three or four months after you've deployed the feature, 
and you're troubleshooting a problem and you're looking at that access list and you're just, what the heck is that wildcard mask doing here? And we find a lot of people that either they didn't deploy the feature in the first place or they can't remember and they start to remove stuff or they uh, jump around access list with a permit IP any any about halfway up and you know, that's not doing anyone any good. So we've got a white paper there if you're interested that talks about how to use IP addressing to help secure your network. We also help network operators understand risk. Yeah, there's a, yeah, again, since it's a jungle out there, it used to be everyone had a, a flat network. You know, it was the M&M, &M, you had the crunchy shell with the soft, gooey chocolate center. Well, nowadays, especially with the targeted threats, we absolutely need to deploy security all through the network. So we talk about security domains. You should have a policy for each of these domains, and then you can start to segment them and uh, look at security features that separate different internal domains as well. So just some examples, you know, on the far left, yeah, between public and private, yeah, a lot of risk there. It's a very, street, very steep risk gradient. So this is where you'd have all your uh, advanced security features, call it, you know, firewall, uh, deep packet inspection, flow inspection, IPS, all that good stuff. Uh, next one, it's internals between production and lab. You should still have safeguards. Maybe it's just an access list and some monitoring. And then on the far right, especially as we move to these um, uh, where you're doing more of your branch type operations over the internet, you probably see a lot of safeguards both at your uh, campus side and at the remote side as well. And then in between, you've got to worry about how you secure your data in transit. And this just uh, you hit it again. It's just um, a representation of what these networks start to look like. Um, I love the colors, especially the bright red internet. But as you can see there, between the campus and the internet, you've got your firewalls, you've got your IPS, and then uh, on the internal side, you've still got safeguards in place because you know, as the uh, attackers get into your network and they start rifling around looking for stuff. You want to have some way of keeping them off of your financial uh, servers, out of your development labs, all that good stuff. You need to find. You need to make sure that you have services in place to catch them. And there's a whole lot of different uh, security features that can be deployed, both if you're in a traditional enterprise type network as well as uh, if you're acting more of a, uh, a service provider for you know, your customers. So with that, we're going to talk about some of the security features that we can deploy on individual devices. Um, hardening them is absolutely critical. It just it buys you time. It, uh, it keeps the low-level riffraff off your network, and we're going to use this information in the lab as well. So if you'd like, if you have your laptops and if you have a SSL VPN, you know, we've got a, a lab back on one of our campuses that you know, we've got attack traffic running through it. We've got routers, we've got firewalls. There's a couple different attacks. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to identify the attack and to mitigate it if you'd like. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Joe Karpenko. Good morning. So what we're going to cover here real quickly is just uh, what we're, our perspective is from a, a device that's in transit of the data path of traffic is three different planes. Um, and, and then we'll also go a, a very quick, sh small overview on secure ops. So secure ops, just from a device's perspective, you know, however, how many, you know, as, you know, Grutz had dem demonstrated yesterday, you know, local user accounts, how many of your people are actually using local user accounts on their devices? Everybody use AAA, TACAX, Radius? How many people actually know what they're using? Awesome. So centralized log collection, we work with many customers that, you know, they send logs to places and they have no clue where the logs are actually going. So one thing to note is that if you're actually sending syslog messages and due to compliance reasons based on which industry that you're in, ensure you know how to get to your damn log device. Secure protocols. Telnet, everybody still using Telnet to access their devices? Yes, no, yes, awesome. I worked at a defense contractor and we used Telnet for a very, very long time. And we finally migrated to SSH. 
So gain traffic visibility with NetFlow. So NetFlow is a uh, traffic telemetry uh, protocol that can be used to provide information about data that is transiting your infrastructure. This can provide visibility into various different things, whether it's traffic that's hitting your infrastructure devices or it's application use of the applications that your users are using. So users browsing the internet, users that are sending DNS lookups. Are those DNS lookups actually going to your trusted DNS server or has that user been compromised and they're sending DNS requests out to a malicious DNS server? And then standard configuration management. Monitor security advisories, you know, regardless of whether this is, you know, security advisories that get published through Cisco, there's also security advisories that get published through other vendors, Oracle, Microsoft, Juniper. You know, if you don't monitor these and you don't ensure that your device is in a secure state, all we have to do is compromise one device with that device, what amount of information is transiting through it, and then can I modify that configuration to funnel that traffic to me, I can intercept it, decrypt it possibly, look what is a payload, I can actually collect information and then return that traffic to its normal data path. So, three planes of the network, we'll cover these and, and what they are and what they look like. Data plane is the actual packets that transit the network, so this is going to be the user data, so email, video, browsing the web. The control plane, the control plane is what stitches our information together on the devices. How do my devices know how to route traffic? They use a routing protocol. So it's very similar to the roadways. What happens if there is a wreck or there is a, a bridge that's down? You have to reroute that traffic. Our control plane, that is composed of our routing protocols. If our routing protocols detect a fault, tolerant, fault they will reroute that traffic. That ensures that packets get end to end. In management plane, this is actually the protocols that make up being able to monitor and manage the device. That's going to be SSH, SNMP, syslog, things of that nature. So in this case, at the very bottom, we can see the data plane. This is the fastest path through the device. Packet comes in, it gets looked up, and it gets automatically switched out to the next interface. The control plane, this is a little bit different because the control plane is traffic that comes to me. So if I am a routing protocol, I actually have to process traffic that I'm receiving being advertised from, say, my BGP peering neighbor. Or if it's a, an OSPF device that I'm receiving routes from, that traffic gets punted up to the route processor. A route processor, processor meaning this traffic is going to be process switched. So they get punted up to the RP. Additionally, you can see ARP. So in IPv4, what happens if ARP breaks? Can you get anywhere? Can't get to the next hop. IPv6, if neighbor discovery protocol, if that breaks, it's the same thing. So we need to ensure that that's up and operational. Management plane is mentioned. We have Telnet, SSH. The, the key difference here is that these planes provide different functions. Both traffic gets punted up to the route processor. So while the traffic gets pointed up to the route processor, we have two different functions here. One is for management of the device. One thing to note is if our control plane is down, our data plane is most likely going to be down unless we're able to actually route around an alternate path. So the management plane and the data plane are dependent on the control plane. So on to attack identification. So NBA network behavioral analysis, you know, how, how many people actually know what's on their network? Because I know quite a few of the financials that we worked with, they had no clue what was on their network. And that can be pretty scary. So I'm just curious, does everybody know what the baseline of their network is? I mean, we had several operators raise their hands and, yeah, I'm an operator, but do you actually know what's running on your network? Any raise of hands now? One? How many of you have friends that don't know what's running on their network? So the key here is to baseline your network traffic and be able to segregate it out to understand, you know, what's email? What is, what, what is the proportion of this is email? What's the proportion that's DNS? What's the proportion that's web traffic? You know, what is other critical applications that are Im imperative to the operation of my business? If you don't baseline the, the, these traffic flows, how do you know when there is a deviation from them? How do you know when there's a potential attack or some type of, you know, uh, abnormal, you know, malicious potential activity that's going on. 
You don't. So we have Cisco iOS NetFlow. It's a technology that's been around forever. You know, essentially the, the easiest way to look at this is it's very similar to a phone bill. So with a phone bill, you have two parties. You have what the source and destination is. You know how long the conversation was. And that's pretty much it. NetFlow goes a little bit more. It gives you actually, you know, how much of that conversation, so how many packets, how many bytes were transferred, things of that nature. So it's definitely not like a wiretap, so you have no idea what was actually discussed within that conversation, but you do get a macro high-level overview of what was actually what actually occurred between two endpoints. So just from a you know export perspective, when we look at the devices within our network, they're essentially like sensors. Sensors being I can collect this information, and then from those sensors I export them out to collectors. You know, depending on, you know, what type of architecture you have, down at the bottom, you know, there's many different, you know, vendors, but you'll have consoles. What will happen is that these collectors will aggregate the information and push it up through the console, and then you'll get a, a holistic overview of all the data that's been sent to multiple collectors. Those are various different versions. The most common one is going to be V5, and we'll go over the actual type of information that's exported within the V5 records themselves. And then... Some of the newer ones, you know, down at the bottom, most notably V9, it's uh, flexible, so it gives us the ability to customize the type of information that I'm going to export. Uh, and then there's also going to be flexible net flow. Right, so you can actually get multicast flow information. You can actually export section of packets if you'd like to export sections of packets. You can get information about BGP next, next hops. Uh, various very interesting pieces of information that you can get depending on what type of environment your network's at your network's you know, operating. So from a V5 NetFlow export, we have the, byte pa the packet count and byte count. So for a specific conversation, this gives us how many packets. So for DNS, ideally, I mean, we're looking at two packets. You got your request, you have your response. Pretty simple. For a TCP transaction on an, on an HTTP GET fetch, that can be a little bit more. And it depends on whether it's going to be a persistent connection or not. The device is uptime. So if your device has an incorrect time, it's going to skew your ability to actually correlate this information with, say, NetFlow or syslog messages. Could be web logs, IPS alerts, things of that nature. It gives you your interfaces on the device. This could be very useful, especially from a traceback perspective, because if you have spoofed traffic that's being received by a device, this allows you to trace the source of that traffic on which interface it was received on. Does that make sense? No? no? Yes? Absolutely. So here's a traditional flow, and uh, the actual key fields are required to create a unique new flow. So we have the address pairs, the port pairs, TOS, layer 3 protocol, and the input interface. Uh, once uh, those values, if those values change, whether it's a source port, destination port, TOS value, or an interface, a new flow will actually be created within the flow cache. And then once the flow termi terminates, that information will be exported out to your flow collector. How do you configure it? Two commands. That's it. So on an interface, you just do IP flow ingress. And then to export this data to a flow collector, you just do that one, one command line. And one thing to note is within each export packet, you're getting information anywhere between 20 to 50 flows. So when we think about this, when you, we look at like a packet capture, a packet capture, if you're actually sniffing the wire and getting the full payload, that's potentially up to 1,500 bytes, and that's just one single packet. So that's not even the full conversation. With an export, you can actually get information about the full conversation within a single export, and not only that, but multiple conversations. So again, it's that, ma that macro level overview rather than that micro level overview. This is the onboard cache of a device. So if you, once you've enabled NetFlow, you can do the show IP cache flow. And within the output of this device, it gives you, again, the source interface. So if some traffic's being spoofed, you know how to perform a traceback. Or if I know a user, if I'm looking for where is a user that's performing malicious activity, I can go to that source interface and then see you know, what is maybe the next hop that they're going to. Destination address. It actually gives you also the protocol, source port, and destination port. And the protocol in this case is going to be in hex as well as the port values. So if you're able to do your hex to a decimal value conversion, it's uh, pretty easy. As you can see, the top ones are all 17, so it's UDP. 
That's it? All right, that's it. So if anybody would like to come downstairs and do the lab, come over and talk to us and let us know. Uh, thank you very much. Check, check. And so we do have a couple minutes for questions, right? Yeah, okay, so if anybody has a question. Um, no questions? Oh, here's one. Uh, so when you're talking about uh, doing net flow collection from all of your sensors there, is that sampled net flow or is that full net flow? That's a good question. It, it, so one, one to one, it depends on where you're going to deploy it at. Uh, so uh, if you're wanting to get one to one, that will give you more of a forensics level overview. But like within your core, within your core, depending on the high speed links that you have, I mean, if you have 10 gig links, I mean, you're ideally not going to want to see every single one to one flow. So you'll actually do sample net flow in that case. So instead of you know collecting you know one to one, you'll do one in one in 1,000 or one in 10,000 flows, and you get. You have to extrapolate a little bit on, on, on the core, but yes, good question. Just a reminder, you do get a drink ticket for asking a question. Any other questions? <laughs> no? Oh, come on. He's got, what, four or five drink tickets left? Come on, people. Yeah, I know it's a little early in the morning for this stuff, so if you want to hold your questions, we'll be here drinking all day. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I